Is that your prayer today? Did you come in one way, but you're ready to leave another? I just speak the fire of God all over you, all over this house in the name of Jesus. I lose passion. I lose glory. I lose an awake spirit in this house in the name of Jesus. I decree over you new life, new strength, new vitality, new vision, new glory. I decree that the fire of God is burning on the inside of you this morning. It is an unquenchable fire. It is a fire that will not die, a fire that will not go out. I decree over you an anointing to touch the lives of everyone around you. I decree your hands are anointed to lay on the sick and they shall recover. I decree your hands are anointed that you shall lay your hands on the addicted and they will be set free. I decree that the Holy Ghost in you is greater than he that is after you. I decree you are powerful, you are mighty, you are strong, you are ready, you are faith filled, you are in it your moment to march into the enemy's territory and take back everything that he has taken from you it is a day of repossession it is a day of repossession it is a day for his kingdom to come and his will to be done if you believe it shall yes hallelujah hallelujah you can be seated this morning. I just felt like saying all that. I want to, uh, I want to begin a new series today, and I want to begin in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. I actually used this verse in my last series, but I kept feeling like I didn't get to the weight of it. Didn't get to the weight of it, and so I just felt impressed to go back and begin to look at it again and pray into it. And so I I just want to share some things with you this morning. And uh, I'm so excited about Activate tonight, and I hope you'll come and join us. And just let God use you, touch somebody's life. You may be the turnaround point for somebody today. Your faith, your love, your prayer may change everything, may change the whole trajectory of their life. You just never know, amen? It may just be a night where you sow a seed in somebody's life and then somebody else waters and eventually somewhere along the way they come to know Jesus. I I just think it's important uh, that we make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit to be used to make a difference. And so this is one way we can do that. So I expect to see you here tonight, all right? All right, Romans chapter 14, verse 16. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit I want to speak for a few moments this morning or uh, on the subject of the sacraments of the kingdom the sacraments of the kingdom as I as I began to go back over this text and study and research and and uh, I came across this statement that caught my attention and the statement was referring to the, the uh, righteousness and the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit as the sacrament of the kingdom. Sacraments of the kingdom. Now, you have to understand, the reason this caught my attention is I'm not a sacramentalist. I'm not sacramental. I'm Pentecostal. I mean, I'm Pentecostal. I don't hide that. I'm, 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 a, I'm a spirit-filled, tongue-talking Laying hands on healing, casting out devils. Pentecostal, through and through, blue and blue. I am what I am. That's what I am. I'm a Pentecostal. And so as as I was studying after a Pentecostal theologian, seminarian, and he uses this word, uh, sacraments, or the statement, sacraments of the kingdom, uh, that kind of caught my attention because as a Pentecostal, I prefer to use the word ordinance. Well, here at Fresh Start Church, in our, in our statement of beliefs, we say we have two ordinances of the church. We just experienced them both this morning. Water baptism and Holy Communion. We call those the ordinances of the church. But as a Pentecostal, I, I, I don't believe in sacramentalism. 
I believe in Pentecostalism. The word ordinance itself means something ordered or decreed. And so when you, when you bring it into theology, it means something ordered or decreed by Jesus to his church. And so when Jesus commands us to do something, it, we should respond to it. We should respond to it in faith, out of obedience. If Jesus said, do it, I want to do it. But what messed me up is I began to go on this journey about sacraments and sacramentalism because I'm Pentecostal through and through. But yet I, I was studying after a Pentecostal theologian and he called these things the kingdom. He called them sacraments of the kingdom. And what really blew me away is I began to study sacrament. I found out the word sacrament is a synonym for ordinance. Okay, wait a minute. As a Pentecostal, I don't believe in sacraments, but I believe in ordinance. But they mean the same thing, sort of. <laughs> Depending on whether you're a Pentecostal or a sacramentalist. This is important where I'm going today because the sacraments of the kingdom. You see, a sacrament is a visible sign of an inward work of grace. Theologians say, especially one of the, the solemn Christian rites considered to be instituted and ordered by Jesus Christ to symbolize or to confer grace. Sacramentalism is a belief in or emphasizes the importance and power of the sacraments for achieving salvation and conferring grace. Okay, this is where I have a problem as a Pentecostal because I'm not a sacramentalist. I'm a Pentecostalism. I'm a Pentecostal. So I, I don't believe sacraments are a means of grace. I believe there are signs of grace. I, 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 I believe that salvation is by grace through faith. This is important where I'm going. You guys are looking at me like a cow looking at a new gate. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> this means that God chose providentially and sovereignly. God chose to impart grace by faith. He chose that. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So grace and faith create a moment of encounter. The sacramentalist and the Pentecostalist both believe this. But they believe it in different ways. This is what I want us to understand. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm making this very strong emphasis that I'm not sacramental but I'm Pentecostal. I'm not into sacramentalism. I'm into Pentecostalism. I'm into a move of God. I'm moved to having an encounter with the Spirit. I'm moved, I'm into being transformed by the power of His Spirit. But by grace, through faith, we are saved. And when faith and grace come together, there is the sovereign powerful encounter we call this being saved jesus called it being born again paul called it being made alive theologians took that term and they call it regeneration regeneration is a radical transformation What we have to understand today is that the human condition without Christ is spiritually and morally dead. And it needs someone to resurrect it. We need someone to make our spirit alive unto God. We need to be transformed in our hearts. The word sacrament means an outward expression of an inward experience. I just mentioned a while ago uh, two of the ordinances of the church is water baptism and the Lord's Supper. There's another one that some churches call a, a, a sacrament. We here don't call it a sacrament, but we do practice it. And that is the laying on the hands with oil. We believe that you can lay hands with oil on the sick and they shall recover. You see, what it does is it, 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 it explains to us that there is a visible, visible expression of an invisible reality. When, when we lay our hands on someone and we anoint them with oil... There's no power in the oil. There's power in the faith of the moment. 
that when somebody touches me and prays over me, I can receive what I need from God because the Holy Spirit is going to come at that moment and he's going to come on me and he's going to transform me. I'm not sacramentalist. I'm Pentecostal uh, all, all the way through. But the difference is that sacramentalist faith is in the material. A true sacramentalist, I'm giving y'all, I'm taking you deeper. I'm giving you a theological lesson. I'm helping you grow. Okay, so, 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 so the difference is, is they believe that when you get baptized, that there's power in the water. All of a sudden, the water becomes uh, uh, holy, and it brings transformation to your life. And just because you went down in the water, you can be saved. It's there that grace is conferred on you. But you can get baptized with no faith, and nothing's going to happen to you. There's no power in the water. We took Holy Communion, but there's no power in the juice. There's no power in the bread. It's my faith in the moment. It's my faith in the reality of Calvary. It's my faith that when I obey, it is an act of worship unto God. And when I worship Him, wherever I am becomes an altar of encounter. Yes. You see, what we have to understand today is grace is not just favor. We understand that salvation, when it talks about grace, grace is in God's unmerited favor where he forgives us of our sins even though we don't deserve to be forgiven of our sins. And when we put our faith in the finished work of our Christ on his cross, that blood cleanses us from all our sin. But grace is not just unmerited favor. It is indestructible force. It is a power that resides with There is a spirit of grace that can come on you any moment and it can literally Literally change everything in your life. So the difference between a sacramentalist faith is that their faith is in the material, the water, the bread, the juice, the oil. As a Pentecostal, my faith is in the moment. That when I obey him to be water baptized, something supernatural can take place around my life. And when I receive Holy Communion, I don't just have to take juice and bread. But out of faith, when I take the juice and bread in obedience, I can believe something supernatural can happen to me. That the spirit of grace can come and bring healing to my body. Bring deliverance to my life. Yes. When I'm being well, I can believe that what has happened in me is now beginning to come out of me and begin to work around me so strongly now that people look at my life and they realize I'm not the same person I used to be because I have encountered, I have had a salvation experience and everything has changed in my life and the work of grace that is in me now is manifesting out of me and they look at you and they say, oh, look, that the grace of God on their life. Yes? This, 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 is, this is important today. Because now sacred moments, sacred actions are more than just religious rites and spiritual formalities. They become an altar of encounter. And when we participate in these things in faith and obedience and worship, we encounter the presence of God. And they become life-changing moments. Nothing to do with the water, nothing to do with the wine, nothing to do or the juice, nothing to do with the bread, nothing to do with the oil. Everything to do with faith and obedience. Let's go back to our text. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So since the sacrament is a visible expression of an invisible reality, then sacraments of the kingdom mean that the kingdom that is within me at some point is supposed to become a reality outside of me. And for us to understand the power of that statement, then I got to do a little kingdom teaching. Well, Kingdom 101, most of you probably know this. I know you guys are so smart. You guys are so biblically intellectual. I know you understand this concept of the kingdom of God, but you may be, may be sitting by somebody that just gave their life to Jesus. And I got to make sure we understand when we talk about the kingdom of God that we understand. The kingdom of God in its simplest form is the rule of God. 
The kingdom of God is the realm of God. The realm is the place in which the king rules. There's three aspects to the kingdom of God. Number one, the eternal kingdom. Number two, the present kingdom. And number three, the future kingdom. The eternal kingdom is, 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 is a broad understanding of the kingdom of God. It speaks of his sovereign rule. It speaks of his rule over the universe. It declares that he is a sovereign God, a God who moves in providence. He is a God and there is no one above him, beside him, or beneath him. He is God all by himself. It is an eternal kingdom, so it has no beginning and it has no end. The kingdom of God has not shut down, never has shut down, and never will shut down. He is king forever and always. Psalms 22, 28 says, For the kingdom, of the Lord, kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over all nations. Psalms 103, 19, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, uh, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. What does all that mean? That means God is in control. No king, no prince, no president is in control. God is in control. A.W. Tozer said, while it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes there is a God who has not surrendered his authority, and he never will. He is still God of gods and Lord of lords. That ought to make you happy, because to know that your God is in charge. No, yeah, 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 yeah. There are men that think they have power, but they're just puppets on a string. They just turn and move like rivers. Our God is a sovereign God, a mighty God. He has relinquished his power to no one and he never will he rules forever and ever and ever the kingdom of god the kingdom of god it's eternal it's present and while when you when you talk about the kingdom of god there there is this broad sense that he rules the universe But the kingdom of God has a more more narrow uh, meaning to it. And it began in the ministry of Jesus. When he made this proclamation in Mark uh, chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, Jesus declared in verse 14. Now after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. With those words, Jesus loosed the kingdom into present time. Because it is from eternity to eternity, it had never been in time. But when Jesus came to earth, he brought the kingdom into time. Uh, It begins with repentance. He said, he said, hey, I come. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's good news because I've been struggling. I've been going, okay, God, we're a revival church. We're pursuing revival. We're going after revival. Where's the connection between revival and the kingdom? There's got to be a connection. And then I realized that the, that the revival is the ignition switch to the kingdom. Because all if there is no repentance, there, there will be no revival. You see, if there is no repentance, there will be no revival. And it is the ignition switch of the kingdom. It activates the kingdom. Jesus came and declared the kingdom is here the kingdom is now I am I carry within me the kingdom the rule the realm of God I have stepped into this planet and Satan has had his way way too long he has kept me bound he has kept me broken he has kept me under his sway but I want you to know the kingdom of God is at hand the king is here the king is here he is among you and everywhere he steps darkness has got to go the powers of the enemy has got to flee 
Yes. And what you have to understand about the kingdom, yes, it is eternal. But when Jesus came at the time, then the kingdom became part of the redemptive rule of God. The object of the kingdom of God is the redemption of men and their deliverance from the powers of evil. The kingdom of God is the reign of God, watch, in Christ, defeating all that is in rebellion and hostile to God's divine rule. The kingdom of God is the redeeming rule of God in Christ, defeating Satan and delivering man from his sway. Our Bible says that this whole world, age, world system is under the sway of the devil. Don't just think there's just stuff happening out there. There's two kingdoms that are activated in this. Right? It's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of his dear beloved son. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. And this kingdom has the capacity, when entered, has the capacity to bring man into righteousness, peace, and joy. So the kingdom is eternal, but the kingdom must be entered. Jesus said... That you must be born again to see the kingdom. Then he said you must be born again to enter the kingdom. So here we understand the redemption of man. When man has an encounter with God and has a salvation experience and is born again, is regenerated, is made into a new creature in Christ Jesus. When the man, the deadness in us is made alive unto God, when that happens, I am positioned in the realm of his reign, his kingdom. So salvation is the accommodation of us come moving into the kingdom. But the kingdom is eternal. But yet through Christ it came into time. And now man has been given an option. Which kingdom do I live in? Which kingdom do I reign in? Which kingdom has most authority over my life? Is it the kingdom of darkness? The realm of the demonic? Or is it the kingdom of God? The realm of the angelic? The realm of holy? The realm of joy? The realm of righteousness? The realm of peace? The realm of healing? The realm of freedom? Or do I live under a brutal dictatorship in the realm of darkness where there is death and despair and despondency and brokenness and a hopelessness that anything better will come along? Well, it did 2,000 years ago when Jesus showed up and said the kingdom of God is here. It's here. It's here. Believe. Repent. Hear the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. Wow. So the kingdom of God has both a present reality and a promise of future fulfillment. As the kingdom is present through Jesus Christ, through his person and through his acts, all out through his ministry, was surrounded with teachings on the kingdom. But he is present today, the kingdom is present today through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit is, the kingdom is present. You must understand the church must not be confused for the kingdom. The church isn't the kingdom. The church is the church. 
The church is in the kingdom, but it's not the kingdom. The church is the fellowship of the believers who come together in worship. It's where we come together. And when we come together, the power of the kingdom is manifested. Or the power of the kingdom is supposed to be manifested. In other words, the power of the kingdom that is in us is supposed to be working out of us. So the power of the kingdom... And when it manifests, it manifested in the cross. It manifests through the cross, through the resurrection and the ascension. And then it passed on to the church. And so the power of the kingdom is supposed to be manifesting and working through the church. You see, the church must manifest the kingdom. Uh, it's not the kingdom, but we are expressions of the kingdom. Now, in other words, the only way that our world, our generation... Where we are right now in time is going to experience the kingdom of God is if somehow it is expressed and or manifested through the church. See, anytime, I, I taught this in my class today, but, but anytime God sends someone to a city and he sends them to that city to establish a church, the only reason he sends them to that city is so they can make a declaration because there's already two things happening when you get there. There's the kingdom of darkness and there's the kingdom of light. And they're already in conflict. But what God needs is somebody in flesh to show up his church and begin to manifest the kingdom at a higher measure than the manifest that the darkness is manifesting. See, we freak out when people, de- when people manifest demonic spirits. Like, oh, my God, they're manifesting. Because it ain't a pretty, pretty thing when demons manifest. But God's saying, I need somebody full of the Holy Spirit that when you show up, you manifest. Manifest the gifts of the Spirit. Manifest the love of God. Manifest the King. Somebody has to display there is a King and a kingdom that is greater. Yes. Now, religion doesn't like that. Because religion likes things to be peaceful in what you do right here. There's so much going on around us. So much happening around us. The, 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 the point I'm driving to is this. A few weeks ago, I was just in prayer, meditating on some things, and I felt the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, the coming harvest would need to experience the full expression of the kingdom. The coming harvest will need to experience the full expression of the kingdom. Well, immediately I begin to ask this question. When it comes to the kingdom, what does it look like? A visible expression of an invisible reality. What does it look like? Because if it is expressed... It will be seen. So I went to Matthew 4, 22. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing the diseased among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and through, uh, th- and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted and with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. That's what the kingdom looks like when it's visible. Huh? Matthew 10, 1, he said, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. You see, when you look at the Gospels and you look at Acts, it makes 20 references to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. So the full expression of the kingdom then can be wrapped up into three ideas. That the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. That demons will be cast out. And that the sick will be healed. 
This is important for, for us uh, to, to understand because this is not just something we do. I believe this is defining for us what the harvest will look like. So, so when the next, the next great harvest that God is going to be bringing, watch this, bringing to his church. Not into his church, but to his church. Because I believe the next great harvest won't be reaped in the house. It will be reaped out of the house. It will be reaped where the church goes. It will be reaped where the church lives. It will be reaped where the church manifests. It's not just getting them in here. You can get them here. But somewhere they've got to experience the full expression of the kingdom. What are they going to look like? They're going to look like somebody that needs to be preached to out of the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom. In other words, a a soft gospel, a fake gospel, a half gospel isn't going to do anything for them. Because they're not wanting to know how to get into heaven. They're wanting to know how can I get out of hell. How can I get out of this mess in my life? How can I get out of all this drugs and all this sex and all these addictions? How can I get out of all this messed up dysfunctional life? I can't get free. But when somebody stands and declares the gospel of the kingdom, there is another realm. There is another king. There is another place to live. Somebody shall yeah. Paul talked about that there would be a different gospel. When he uses that term different gospel, he's talking about a deluded message. In other words, it's, it's going to be void of power, though it is nominally Christian. We don't get deceived by stuff that's way out left. We get deceived by stuff that's like really close, but not quite. I had to read. Had to renew my vocabulary because it, uh, you, you, would, you, you would you would try to bring people to Jesus, and, and you would say, "All you have to do is, all you have to do is say this prayer with me, and you will be saved." That's true, but it's not the full truth. You have to have an encounter because you have to be born again. You don't go to heaven by making the right decision. You go to heaven because you have an encounter by the Spirit of God, and He changes you on the inside, and your whole world changes. I felt the Holy Spirit say the salvation must be at an encounter level. We made it, we made it, we made it, we stopped too soon. We forget to tell people now. Now by faith, by faith you have received Jesus Christ and grace is working in you. But it's not just favor, it's a powerful force. And it's going to begin to change your desires. It's going to begin to change the way you live. You won't be priority, he will be priority. Your kingdom's coming down, his kingdom is coming up. The danger of a fake gospel is it keeps people coming to church but without having a relationship with Jesus Christ, not being transformed and changed. There needs to be an encounter level, not just a decision, but a collision with the Holy Spirit that wrecks and rocks our world. So the next harvest is going to flood the altar and say, give me something that can change my life. It will be so powerful. It would be like when, they, when there was such a powerful move of God in Antioch. And the apostles had not been there yet. So they sent Bartimaeus to check on what was going on in Antioch. Because revival had broke out. And there wasn't an apostle there. So they send Bartimaeus out of Jerusalem. Bartimaeus goes and he checks it out. And he looks around. And he makes this statement. He said, I witnessed the grace of God. What does that mean? When the grace of God does an inward work, there will be an outward manifestation of grace. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful I just didn't get forgiven. I'm thankful that I was transformed. I'm thankful that he has broken every chain of my life. I'm thankful that I just don't live a redeemed life I live a restored life somebody shout yes
He's talking about a gospel that when it is preached, it is confirmed with signs following. The coming harvest is going to need this. They're going to need to come in sick and leave healed. Come in bound and leave free. Come in lost and leave found. Come in carnal and leave spiritual. If they don't get that, they're going to keep looking until they find it. Then he said, he talked about casting out devils. This, 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 we, religious people get real uncomfortable with this. Go to Mark, was it Mark 1? Now, there was a man in the synagogue church with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What, we ha- what do we have to do with you in Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? The answer would be yes. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, he cried out with a loud voice and came out. The next wave of harvest is going to need to experience deliverance. I know y'all know this because you're, you're, you're biblical, uh, biblical people. You understand that in the end time, there's going to be a flood of demonic powers. There's going to be a hordes, hordes of hell that are going to attack this people planet. They're coming in because they know their time is short. And they understand they're trying to control humanity and destroy humanity while the redemptive power of Christ is getting stronger and stronger. And the gospel of the kingdom is being preached more powerful and more powerful. There's going to be a war that's going to be waged over the souls of men. And I've got to, I felt the Lord so many, there, 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 there's going to be an unleashing of an unclean spirit like this planet has never seen before. I know Jesus dealt with it. Almost every demon that he dealt with that he named was an unclean spirit. There's an unclean spirit that's getting ready to be released on this people planet. And we have to understand this because when they come in, we can't give them a little prayer. We can't give them a half gospel and pat them on the back and say, go live for Jesus. Somebody's going to have a have enough discernment and authority to look that demon in the eyes and let them know you don't own this man anymore. You don't own this woman anymore. They've been bought by the blood of Jesus. Now you get out and leave them alone. You leave them alone. You better get ready because there's coming a wave of an unclean spirit. We better get clean now because if we don't get clean now, we'll get swept up in the wave. Somebody help me preach. The unclean, the, the unclean spirit is, is defined as an impure spirit. It is used 20 times in the New Testament if you think I'm making things up. Uh, they're not only wicked themselves, but they delight in wickedness and they, they like to promote wickedness through humans. We must be careful. We must guard our hearts. You see, when you are oppressed, possessed with an unclean spirit, you take pleasure in corrupt, vile actions and thoughts. It's it's not natural. Our culture tells us it's natural. And so if we're not careful, we buy into it. And begin to live under the weight of it. They're coming. And there has to be a people who they themselves has risen above the power and the influence of these spirits. Is this all right? Luke 13, 10 says, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues church on the Sabbath. 
And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no way raise herself. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmities. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorify God. Not only do we need to understand as the harvest begins to come, they need to hear the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. They're going to have demons to need to be casted out. And they're going to come in and they're going to be sick. And they need to be healed. I believe this is one of the reasons that the enemy has fought divine healing so greatly in the church. As well as deliverance. Because he doesn't want us free and healed when the sick come in. He wants us to he- believe the lie that God doesn't heal anymore. And that God doesn't deliver. Live with it. You know what I hate about religion? It'll speak the truth and then tell you why not to expect to have it in your life. It'll tell you everything that is right that you should believe and then tell you don't believe it. As this unclean spirit is being released against humanity, there's also going to be a spirit of infirmity, which is probably already at work. That's why the pharmaceutical business is doing so well. That's why every other commercial on your TV is about some kind of drug to take care of some kind of sickness. Because they don't want you to be healed. They just want you to be addicted. They don't want, they're not worried about getting you well. They're just worried about trying to keep you alive so you can keep. But we have a wounded healer. I said, we have a wounded healer. We have a healer. By his stripes, we were healed. I still believe in the healing power of Jesus. I said, I still believe in the healing power of Jesus. I've been through sickness. I've been through disease. I've been through brokenness. But I still believe he is a healer. And there's going to come a point where the church has got to arise in kingdom authority and power. And tell that spirit of infirmity, let them go. Let them go. You know what I found out when I begin to study this word, uh, spirit of infirmity. This spirit, this word, infirmity means it means a, a dis- disabling spirit. It's a spirit that will disable you because it wears you down. It's like going from one sickness to another sickness to another sickness. And it's like I get over one thing and then there's something else. If that's your life, look, I know not every sickness is caused by sin. I know we live in a broken, uh, sick world full of disease. And I know all of that. But let me tell you, somehow our faith must arise to meet the challenge of our generation. And this is a sick generation, physically disabled, physically broken down. If anybody knows about a disability, I do. And it can wear on your flesh until it begins to wear on your emotions and it begins to wear you out. Proverbs, watch this. Proverbs 18, 14, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? This comes a time when the sickness itself overwhelms you and you begin to be broken in your spirit and you can't hardly have the will to stand against it but I have come to declare to you today there is a healing Jesus there is a healing Jesus and we as the church must bring to bear the kingdom of God on a broken generation we must raise them up and declare healing over their bodies rise up be healed rise up be healed rise up Somebody shout, yes! Yes. Just everyone stand, please. For 18 years, she was bowed over. Until finally the king and the kingdom showed up. For 18 years, she sat in that church bowed over 
broken. And one word from Jesus, one word from Jesus, daughter of Abraham. Rise up. We don't know how long the man was possessed with an unclean spirit, but it just took one word. Shut up and go. Two words. Oh, how God needs his church to walk in this level of kingdom authority for the sake of humanity. For the bound and the broken. Those who are not afraid to speak the fullness of truth. I didn't know where I was going to go this morning when I got here to this point. I was struggling with two, two ways I could go and we could pray, lay hands on people and Belief for healing, belief for deliverance. Because I'm going to get to these, these three sacraments of the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy. Not today, but we'll get there. But I think it's really time. That we take what God is doing in us and begin to release it to the world that is around us. There's so many hurting, broken people. Just, you know, when we, when we were walking, and we did a lot of walking, tough on a guy with a. Anyway, I'm not even going to say it. And I had this conversation with Tony, and just a few minutes later, I had this conversation with Kim. She almost said the same as that thing I said to Tony. When we were walking from uh, Washington Monument to the Supreme Court, I was just like, man, I thought when we got here, it would be all, you would feel all chaotic and anxious and like this, like this is a swamp or something. But you know what I felt? I felt peace. I felt hope. And after just spending just a few minutes with Congressman Franks, I felt like there is a chance for this nation to experience revival. There is a chance. This could happen. There are men and women of God, of righteousness, sitting in the places of government we don't know about. Hundreds of congressmen and congresswomen that meet for prayer and Bible study. We just hear all this other stuff. But I'm telling you, God's at work. But with all that said, the hope of our nation is a church that understands that they live in a kingdom. And it has real power to bring real change and to bring real transformation. I believe this morning, before we leave, I just want to pray over you. And I want to release over you a revelation of who you are in the King, in the kingdom of God. I want you to know that you can really be a world changer. As we went from monument to monument to monument, all you saw were regular men, everyday people that shaped history. There are history shapers all over this room. Just takes a revival church. Just takes a revival remnant. Paul said, 
there is one that restrains the lawless one. The spirit of the Antichrist that wants to take over and fill this people planet full of evil. But there is a restrainer. If he could do it, he would have already done it. As long as the church is full of his spirit, we are a force to be reckoned with. Just throw your hands up. I could ask you to come forward, but this just it would be just crowded today. But I just feel like I need to do this. And as we move along in this series, we'll get to some things. But I just I just want to get this deep in our hearts. How revival has been so powerful in the last two plus years, but now, now we're coming to a place where that was that is which in us must be worked out of us. So, Lord, I speak over your people in the name of Jesus. I, I decree over them in the name of Jesus a revelation of who they are. I decree over them in the name of Jesus that they would have these hands, O oh God, that are holy unto you. Hands that can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Hands, oh God, that can lay hands on the addicted and they will be set free. Hands that will heal the broken hearts and the broken spirits and the broken emotions of, of our world today, God. I send them out, oh Lord, into their places of work. I send them out into their neighborhoods. I send them out, oh God, to go make a difference like they have never seen. Oh God, I believe this is our moment. This is our time. I believe that the kingdom of God is among us. I say kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven over your people. I decree activation right now in the name of Jesus we are revived and we are activated in the name of Jesus I, we will place a mark on this city we will place a mark in this region we will make a mark on this nation by your grace I thank you for it today father in the name of Jesus and everybody shouted yes I do want to pray over those today that need healing or deliverance. If you need healing and deliverance, if you'll run to the front right now, I just want to lay hands on you real quick. And I just want to pray over you real quick and believe that God is going to touch you today. Just come quickly.
I want to pray against the spirit of fear this morning. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, I just want to pray against it. And the reason why I want to pray against it is because, as my husband said, as we walked those streets in D.C., I was expecting to feel turmoil and and anxiety. But I cannot begin to describe to you the sense of overwhelming peace that I felt. And I don't know if it's because there were thousands of women that had just left there praying through the, 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 the organization of Blue Eagle or not the weekend before. There's 24-7 prayer and worship going on right in the heart of D.C. It's called David's Tent. And there was such peace there. And I said, God, this is not what the average American thinks. They don't realize that there's peace here because our media is telling us that there's all kinds of turmoil. And I'm not saying there's not a spiritual war going on. But I come to tell us this morning that the enemy wants to cripple us with fear. Because if he can cripple us with fear, we will not we will not release the purposes of God in the earth so lift your hands and let me break that all of us today in the name of Jesus Lord I bind the lies of the enemy right now the lies that tell us that we have to give in to fear and we have to give in to anxiety and we have to give in to the plans and the schemes of the enemy I bind those lies of the enemy and I release right now in Jesus name Jesus and I break fear off of your life in Jesus name be set free by the power of God be set free by the spirit of God spirit of fear you must go in Jesus name spirit of fear you must go I command be released right now and walk in faith and walk in freedom give Jesus a shout 